Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Stallings, and I'm the director of the UT Dallas Chess Program. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 18th Annual Chess Educator of the Year Award presentation. The 2021 honoree is Gerald Times. Uh, you'll notice everybody has been muted. If you have any questions, just go down to the chat at the bottom of the screen and submit those there. We're also pleased to say that this event is sponsored by Homelight. It's a property tech startup that helps thousands of home buyers and sellers efficiently to make more informed decisions. They, their sponsorship of many teams represents a better way for them to get involved with the local communities. On behalf of UT Dallas and the chess team, thank you, Homelight. All right, just a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, go down to the bottom there. And just Now, introducing our honoree tonight is Dr. George Fair. He's Vice President of Diversity and Community Engagement, Professor and Dean of the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Dean Fair has always been a strong advocate for public education and the attainment of quality education regardless of background or socioeconomic status. Three of the programs he oversees are the Academic Bridge Program, the New College Readiness Initiative, and Jumpstart. Dean Fair. Thank you, James. I'm happy to be here. Gerald Times is a native New Yorker and a current resident of Harlem, New York. Gerald started playing chess at age 11, which he says was way too late to start, but somehow he caught up and became the Harlem chess champion at age 14. In 2002, he was designated chess master by the World Federation of Chess. Gerald graduated from Rice High School in Manhattan and subsequently earned his BS from St. John's University in 2009. Gerald is also an accomplished and published poet. Early in his career, Gerald worked with the Teachers and Writers Collaborative and taught poetry to students of all grade levels. While there, he organized poetry readings in homeless shelters and drug rehab programs that resulted in poetic pamphlets. During his versatile career, Gerald also worked for the Harlem Educational Activities Fund at the acclaimed Mott Hall School in Manhattan and as a chess director of the Harlem Children's Zone. At both these programs, Gerald worked with at-risk students and through a holistic chess program he designed, turned them into champions and academic scholars. In 2010, Gerald started the Harlem Chess Corporation. Its mission, to change the lives of urban and at-risk youth through the teaching of, special, of his special chess curriculum. In 2010, his mission took him to Cape Town, South Africa as a chess curriculum developer for the New York McNulty Foundation. He soon progressed from township teacher to become the national coach of South Africa. In 2011, Gerald's teams took second and third in all of Africa in the all African games. Upon his return to the States, he worked at the Dalton School where he helped lead several of their chess teams to national championships. Gerald's accomplishments as an instructor, chess master, and poet are numerous. Here are a notable few. Chess commentator for PBS, August 1985 to January 1986. Analyzed the Kasparov World Champion match to a national audience. Winner of seven national championships. 1993 to 2007, curator of the Langston Hughes House, 1995 to 2004. Currently, Gerald is working on with the Left Frame Filming Company to produce a documentary of the Mott Hall School in Harlem. Thank you, Gerald, for all that you have contributed to the chest education. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fair. Uh, let me see, let me share the screen here for the PowerPoint presentation. Let me, 
All right, so thanks, uh, Mr. Stallings, for this wonderful award. Alexi Root for the honorable mention. Once again, uh, George Fair for your outstanding introduction. Uh, Tim Steiner, I am thanking you in advance uh, for your technical support throughout this uh, presentation. There is a theme in folklore that states that the rabbit has the gun. First, you were hunting the rabbit. Now the rabbit is hunting you. It is a metaphor for overcoming the odds. There is a similitude in Greek mythology. The Greek god Prometheus steals the fire from the gods and he gives it to men. It is the purpose of this presentation to give you the rabbit's gun, the fire of the gods, the best tools, practices, and techniques used by the most contemporary teachers to close the achievement gap. While in South Africa, I heard this beautiful term. Uh, it is called Ubuntu. It is a Zulu word. It translates to I am because you are. Uh, the Zulus believe that the self is the collection of other people. Thus, Ubuntu is a unifying force connecting all humanity. Great chess programs work in a similar fashion. It is the combination of dedicated students, teachers, parents, school leaders, community boards, philanthropists, all coming together to form a workable program. Would like to talk about the power of chess and what it does for young people. Besides chess being a academic boost and a competitive sport, Chess is also a life skill. Marcus Aurelius states, the impediment to action advances action, which stands in the way becomes the way. In chess, we do not go around, we go through. The opponent is the dragon we wish to slay. It is a trickster that we meet at the crossroads. I heard this beautiful story told to me by Marley Kaplan, she is the former president of chess in the schools. A group of young chess players were asked a very simple question. If you came to a diving board and you were afraid to jump off, would you come back again? The overwhelming majority of chess players said that they would. Now there are many inferences, inferences that we can draw here, but the key point is that chess is not just a path of intellect, it is also a path of courage. Tatakawa says, chess ennobles man because it is filled with disappointments. And chess uh, is about learning, life is about learning, but we are not just learning how to win. We are, we are also learning not to lose. The law of losing states that it's okay to lose a chess game. What's not okay is to lose a chess game the same way again. Wisdom is not the absence of error, Wisdom is the absence of the same error. What Dr. Cower is implying that the very process of self-correction ennobles us. He also seems to indicate the process of becoming a strong chess player not only makes you a better thinker and a better decision maker, it also makes you a better human being. Would like to share with you a few of the Revelations of the Margulis Report. Uh, Stuart Margulis is a PhD recipient from Columbia University. He is also a, a chess master. In the 1990s, he conducted a three-year study on chess in reading scores. I should mention there was a control group that didn't get chess, and there was an experimental group uh, that got chess. He found out after three years, the experimental chess group improved in reading scores. Now we already knew the relationship between chess and mathematics, logical sequencing, calculation, abstract reasoning. But the idea that chess could improve literacy, reading scores, test scores, in some cases standardized uh, placement test scores was a, a revelation. What the study shows that chess is not just for smart kids, Chess also makes kids smarter. 
the school system often does not judge us by our grades. Uh, it judges us also by our test scores. Uh, we can uh, make the following connections here. Because I play chess, I'm more focused. Uh, because I'm more focused, I do better in school and test. Uh, because I do better in standardized tests, I go to better schools. Because I go to better schools, I have more opportunities in life. Chess has the power to change one station. All right, so we're going to talk about what exactly is the achievement gap. And we have to ask some key questions. Why do certain communities succeed over others? Why do certain schools succeed over others? And why do certain scholars outperform other scholars? So the, the gap can be defined as those that have access to an early start, private lessons, and exposure to top competition. It can also be measured in course per child ratios and school spend. Uh, several years I've worked in the private sector. I will let you know that it was not unusual for families to spend six to $7,000 per child. If 20 of those scholars went to the national championship uh, from that private school, uh, they spent north of 120 to $140,000 a year. Uh, the gap can also be measured by school spend and course per child ratios. So why does the gap matter? Because it grows over time. If you allow me to switch lanes here to the professional setting, there are over 1,600 grandmasters in the world. 10% of that would be 160. 1% 1 of that would be 16. However, there are only five black grandmasters in the world. But black grandmaster representation is less than 1%. If we want to close the achievement gap, we have to begin on the youth in scholastic levels. The two determining factors of, of success of a child in chess is number one, family income, and number two, access to a top performing coach. Affluent families with, this, with a disposable income who have the resources, can nurture and develop talent. A top coach does three basic things. Uh, number one, they correct the child's moves. Uh, number two, they correct the child's thinking. And number three, they prepare the child for top level competition. If a public school has access to top level coaching, to some degree, they can level the playing field. All right, we're going to look at the socioeconomics of performance. Uh, this is the grade school nationals, the 2010 results of the grade school nationals. Uh, the grade school nationals is given once a year, usually in Orlando, uh, Florida. It decides which schools have the best grades in the nation. In other words, your school has the top third grade team in the nation, or your school has the top fourth grade team in the nation. Uh, right now, I want you to concentrate on the blue lettering. The blue re lettering represents the private schools. As you can see between the kindergarten and fourth grade, these five uh, divisions, uh, there are five uh, private schools that took first. There was a tie with two pri private schools in fourth grade. Uh, here you see in third grade, I included the Hunter Elementary School. It is a Upper East Side school in Manhattan in a uh, opulent community. And so I've included it with the private schools. Here again, you see the Regnard Elementary School. It is also in a well-resourced uh, community. So I've included it with the uh, private schools. Our top 10th grade team in the nation is a private school, top 11th grade team in the nation. And uh, Bronx Science, again, is a public school, but is a well-resourced public school a gifted and talented pro program in New York City. It is included with the private schools. Now let's look at the Title I schools that won the uh, Gray School Nationals in 2010. As you can see, one of these schools is 318. They won three sections, a top six, seven, and eighth grade team in the nation. Uh, the SVA school in Texas also won the top uh, ninth grade team in the nations. Let's look at the metrics of the performance. Uh, there were 14 teams that placed first. 
two of those teams came from Title I schools. That is a 14% representation. Uh, out of the 13 divisions, four of them were won by Title I schools. That is a 31% representation. Well-resourced public schools and private schools won nine out of possible 13 uh, divisions. That is a 69% representation. As you can see, economics plays a role in performance. All right, before I go any further, I would like to give a shout out to the uh, public sector. If you're a teacher in the public schools and you teach chess, you're more likely to gain classroom management skills, write lesson plans, learn how to motivate scholars. There is a certain job satisfaction in, in the public sector of seeing so many young people overcome challenges. Here, we are going to look at the economics in play. Perhaps the biggest advantage in the private sector is something known as parent fee-based uh, programs. Uh, affluent parents with a disposable income can afford private lessons, after-school programming, online memberships, summer camps, and so forth. Uh, in contrast, in the public sector, usually the parents are solely dependent upon public school funding. Private schools all are also more likely to have in-house chess programming. Uh, they will hire their own teachers, coaches, and tournament organizers. Uh, in the public sector, they may outsource to an external vendor like chess in the schools. Uh, that, ex that, that external vendor will bring in uh, teachers and tournament uh, organizers. A very important point is that the private sector chess programs are often for profit, and therefore it is more self-sustaining uh, I would recommend those who have chess programs in the public sector that you go out and you uh, seek uh, philanthropy. All right, I would like to talk about the three C's of closing the achievement gap. The first C is confidence. We must build the confidence skill set of our scholars. Uh, the second C is competition. How do we build strong competitors? And the third C is curriculum, the essential knowledge that leads to the mastery of content. All right, building their confidence. There are many tenets, uh, pillars that we use. I'm going to share four of them with you. Uh, something that's very important is that no matter what, they're okay. Uh, the scholars must know that we have an unconditional relationship with the results. Uh, they are not winners because they win and they are not losers because they lose. Uh, the most important thing a scholar can know is that you are committed to their journey. Uh, the scholars must be responsible for their losses. Uh, chess game is a mirror of our best moves and mistakes. Uh, they must learn the turning points why they lost. Uh, in some cases, why uh, why they won as well. The most important thing for the, them to know here is they have the ability to overcome uh, so their circumstances. Very important point, point is that we must raise the self expectation of the competitor. I like to say the expectation is hope on steroids. We don't hope that we can win a chess game. We know that we can win a chess game. We must create nurturing environments where scholars do not underestimate their abilities. All right, so there is this idea that the chess board is the hero's journey. Uh, scholars may actually self-actualize uh, uh, on the chess board. They may meet their darkest fears, negotiate self-doubt, overcome obstacles. This may lead them on the path to win trophies, tournaments, championships is the very process of becoming a strong chess player that allows them to discover who they really are. All right, so closing the achievement gap uh, will be the second uh, pillar, competition. Should mention here, we need to increase the number of games. That is the golden rule. Uh, if we increase the number of games, we increase their patent recognition 
if we increase the number of games, we also increase their strategic and tactical uh, execution. Uh, the game equals time management, problem solving, and the ability to perform under stress. They must practice, practice these skills over and over again. We'd like to walk with you through kind of a staircase, what I call positive correlations uh, that leads to the uh, national uh, championship. So if we increase the number of games, we also increase the rating. A rating is a measurement of performance. Uh, that competition must also be a quality competition. It also helps if we play higher high rated players. Uh, ratings rise uh, generally if we get a chance to play higher rated players. Uh, there's a positive correlation between the rise in rating and placements in tournaments. And finally, there is a positive correlation between placements in tournaments and winning championships, city, state, and national championships. It all begins with increasing the number of games. All right, so there are several methods of increasing the number of games. I recommend uh, USCF affiliates. Uh, USCF affiliates gives you a license to hold rated games in your building. Uh, the operative term here is decentralized competitions. Um, in short, instead of five schools going to a single site, uh, each school can hold tournaments inside of their own uh, building. I recommend online memberships. Online memberships allows your scholars to play chess online. Uh, these sites often allow you to organize uh, tournaments uh, online. Um, the operative, operative term here would be multi-site uh, tournaments. So, sorry, let me, uh, uh, multi-site tournaments. I'm oh, sorry, let me just, uh, okay. Um, and what that means is that scholars can access these digital tournaments via computers, laptops, and even their phones. All right, so we also have to increase the number of hours. All right, so no one is born a grandmaster. No, there are no natural born masters. Chess is practice, practice, practice. Um, if you want to teach the whole school chess, I would suggest that you create a, a, a uh, I'm sorry, let me turn this off here. Uh, if you want to teach the whole school chess, I would suggest that you create an elective, uh, a, excuse me, a, a curriculum, a general curriculum tr a track. If you want to uh, teach kids who are a little bit more passionate about, uh, about the game, I would suggest that you uh, create elective tracks. For those scholars that would like to compete in tournaments, I would also suggest that you create after school programs. If you have the funding for summer school programs, uh, that would be significant. Let me just say that the magic number in chess is about eight hours a week. That's 32 hours uh, per month times 10 months is 300, over 300 hours per year. Uh, some, in, uh, some of the programs allows you to increase the number of hours. I'd like to give you a uh, anecdote about the Rosin Yellow School. Uh, this is a school in the South Bronx. The majority population there was uh, reading below the, uh, the grade level. Uh, we gave them a uh, summer program at six hours a day times five days a week. Uh, that was uh, 30 hours per week times five weeks. That was an additional 150 hours. If you put all the math together, the original 300 hours and the additional 150 hours, uh, that school had 450 hours uh, a year uh, for chess. Eventually, the Rosignalo School uh, won the state champ uh, two divisions in the state championship in 2000. Uh, 18, it all begin uh, by increasing the number of games. All right, so there's usually about three years it takes to win a uh, national uh, championship. The first year, the scholars have to learn how to play chess. The second year, they are honing their skills. Uh, the third year, they are moving towards uh, excellence and we are creating uh, champions. 
If you can see, if you can follow my path here, we have increased the number of games. We have increased the number of hours alongside consecutive years of chess. Uh, we can close the achievement gap uh, that way. All right, we're going to begin with the third aspect of closing the achievement gap, which is the curriculum. Uh, I would like to say something very important here is that we should begin where they are. I'd like to tell you about Dave uh, McAnulty. Uh, many of you may know about Dave McAnulty because there was a movie made about him called Knights of the South Bronx. He was a uh, teacher in the Bronx. His job was to teach uh, chess, didn't teach math, didn't teach English. Uh, he taught the whole school how to play chess. Uh, he was aware that many of his scholars lacked a certain background knowledge when it came to uh, geometric concepts. Uh, he had a very simple mission statement. He said, if you can understand a straight line, uh, then you can play chess. I would like to demonstrate uh, his concept. So we're going to look at McAnulty's uh, concepts. Uh, if you understand a straight line, uh, you can play chess. So our story begins here with a straight line. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points. If two straight lines connect, they form a right angle. Uh, McAnulty taught them that this is, this is the right angle to create a square. If two right angles meet, they actually create four right angles, which is a square. Uh, he let them know that squares were either dark or light, and that these squares could actually form a rank. A rank is also a straight line. He let them know that these squares can also form another straight line, which is a foul. And finally, he let them know that they can also form a third straight line, which is a diagonal. I should mention here that often because the diagonal moves in a slant, the, uh, many of the scholars believe it's not a straight line, but the diagonal is also a straight line. And of course, chess has a light square diagonals and dark square diagonals, so we should demonstrate the light square diagonal. All right, so now we're gonna use these three lines to build a chessboard. Uh, let's build a chessboard first with fouls. Let's build a chessboard with ranks. And now let's build a chessboard with diagonals. By which by there are 26 diagonals. And there we have it. Everything begins with a straight line. So Tim, can everybody uh, see the uh, present screen? So ask again, Tim, can everybody see the uh, present screen? Yes. Okay, yes, perfect. yes, we can. All right, so um, another important thing is we need to teach the whole school how to play chess. Uh, this creates the culture of acceptance for the game. Uh, we avoid labels like geek or nerd. Uh, if the whole school knows how to play chess, we're moving towards normalization of the, of the game. I'd like to give you an interesting study. Uh, demonstrates the importance of learning chess at a young age. Uh, the study was conducted by uh, Andrews uh, Erickson. He found out if you were 17 years old in the 19th century and you started chess at 17, you still had a chance of being a pretty strong chess player. When, we, when they moved to the 20th century, uh, the starting age to be a grandmaster, you had to learn chess at least by the age of 14. Chess has grown in complexity in the 21st century. To be a grandmaster uh, today, you have to start chess by the age of seven. 
I would suggest that uh, in your curriculum that you consider teaching kindergartners and even preschool uh, to give them it's yet another way to close the, the achievement gap by creating a uh, early start. All right, let's look at some digital tools. Uh, we'd like to give out a, a shout out to a few uh, New York City teachers like Giovanni Merritt, uh, Terrell Harriet, uh, Yvette Fresnel. They all use these tools in uh, their classrooms. Uh, let's, start, let's start with Google uh, Classroom. Uh, the operative term here is asynchronous uh, classrooms. Uh, we can now micro-target each student in the classroom with an individualized lesson. Uh, in the uh, public sector, we often cannot, pro uh, uh, many of the scholars cannot afford private lessons. So the fact that you can individualize them with, with assignments is a huge advantage. Let's just go into the room. All right, so this is an example of a student asking me, uh, you know, what should they do uh, about studying uh, with Rooks? Uh, here is the key point. We can give them many examples, not just one inside of the Google Classroom. And let me just give you another share here. Um, by the way, this is a mobile board. If I just move a few pieces, in the study. And it, and it shows that white is winning by, by domination of queen versus rook. All right, let me go to, one more study here, let me hit new share again. And the Google Classroom allows me to do another uh, combination here. And I'll just show you that this is a mobile board. Uh, we're using uh, Lead Chess to uh, share these studies. Let me just hit new share and make sure everyone has it. And again, and this is simply an example of Checkmate, uh, but the scholar is given uh, various uh, tools. Uh, we cannot uh, always uh, individualize in terms of private lessons, but we can give them uh, individual assignments. This is a great way of compensating uh, the uh, idea that you can, uh, that many of these kids cannot afford private lessons. All right, let's let me stop to share here. Let me go back to all right. So Google Forms. Let me hit new share. Right, so there are many uh, assessments uh, that a teacher can do. You can ask a scholar a question uh, to see if they understand the concept. You can observe their games. Uh, another assessment is observing their rating. Did the rating go vertically north or vertically south? All of these are assessments. Perhaps the most tr uh, traditional assessment are quizzes and tests, which Google Forms allows us to do. Uh, the great thing about uh, this is that it is actually connected to a spreadsheet. So for example, you can see the scholars scores and this is just a great way of measuring uh, your assessments uh, through tests and uh, quizzes. Let me just come out of here again. Hit new share. All right, so would like to show some of the things that we can do with a uh, Excel uh, program. All right, this is data transference. This is me taking the 2019 uh, nationals, uh, putting it in a uh, Excel sheet. 
Uh, we're breaking everything up by sections. We're trying to get a uh, the average rating or the uh, median uh, rating for each section. Let me scroll down a little bit. Let me just once again say that a, a rating is a measurement of performance. It's similar to a batting average in baseball or a, a GPA in academics. The higher the rating, the better the performance. As you can see in the open section in the grade school nationals, uh, the average rating is uh, 1519. So kind of want to give you a what I call all the 200, 300 point uh, rule here. If you're preparing next year uh, for the uh, national championships, um, your average team rating would have to be at least 200 points higher than this, meaning your average team rating would have to be around 1719. And your performance rating, when we say your performance rating, it simply means how well you performed in that particular tournament would have to be at least 300 points higher than that rating. So uh, you will see it would have to be at least 1819. If we go to the uh, under 1400 section, I'm just gonna scroll down here to see the uh, Average rating, uh, we can see that the average rating in the under 1400 section is 1178. If we go by the 200, 300 point rule, we know that the uh, team average, well, well actually in all of these sections and the under sections, meaning anything but the open section, the average rating cannot be above uh, 1400, but the performance uh, rating should be above uh, 1400. So here we're simply gonna go by the performance rating and the performance rating should be somewhere around 1478. I'm just going to scroll down here to the pivot table. And here we can see the average ratings uh, throughout the United States in the K6 uh, section. Uh, uh, in the K6 open, we see 1519 is the highest rating. And under in the 500 section, the lowest the average rating is about 287. Uh, the average rating in the nation is 912. Uh, that should be a measurement for you. If, you're, if your average team rating of your program is over 1,000, uh, then you're doing pretty, pretty good. However, if you're competing in the top sections, as you can see, you will probably need a performance rating somewhere north of 1,700. All right, so last thing I would like to mention is uh, Lee Chess, the operative term here. Oops, let me make sure, share. All right, so the op operative term here is a digitization of your program. Uh, Lee Chess gives us a lot of tools. Number one, they can play a myriad of players online. Uh, there's this concept here of self-paced learning. That's uh, any type of learning outside of the uh, classroom. Puzzles, studies, videos, are all apart. Okay, let me see. If we can go back to this page. Um, all right, so these are some of, of the studies that Alicia has allows you. Uh, they have beginner studies and more advanced studies. And last thing, I would like to go to uh, tournaments. Here you see this thing called arena tournaments. Now this is a very important feature. Uh, for example, on a Saturday, you wanna organize a virtual tournament, a digital tournament. And the arena tournament will allow continuous games, meaning uh, round two uh, won't start at three o'clock or round four won't start at five o'clock, but rather the kids can play continuous games. Uh, under Lee Chess, the arena game format, allows you to finish your tournaments within two or three hours. All right, I would like to talk about the accomplishments of black chess players. Uh, there's a young lady by the name of Medina Perilla. Actually, in 2008, uh, she traveled with us to uh, Texas. 
Uh, she won the All Girls National Championship. Uh, it was the top division, the under 18 division in the All Girls National Championship. Uh, in 2012, Rochelle Ballantine uh, won the under 16 section in the All Girls uh, National uh, Championship. All right, now there's really a remarkable team uh, from 318. Uh, this team was led by three young uh, African-American masters, uh, Jerron Bryant, Justice Williams, and James Black. Uh, they went to the high school championships. Let me just say they were a middle school that went to the high school championships and they won the high school championships. It is the only time in scholastic chess history that a middle school has ever won uh, the high school uh, chess championships. Uh, there was the race uh, for the youngest black chess master. Uh, previously, it was uh, won by Justice uh, Colas at the age of 10. Uh, that record has been re recently smashed uh, by Bruinton Hardaway. He made uh, the youngest chess master at the age of 10 years old. We'd like to talk about the accomplishments on the uh, professional uh, level. Uh, Maurice Ashley is a common name in chess. Just wanted to mention a few more of his accomplishments. Uh, Maurice Ashley was the coach of the 1991 team, the Raging Rooks, uh, that made front page of the New York Times. Um, this team was very important because essentially it became the uh, impetus uh, for more investment inside of, the inner, inside of the inner city schools. After the Raging Rooks made front page, uh, chess became more of a, a universal. In 1996, uh, Maurice met Gary Kasparov. Uh, this began his uh, journalistic uh, career. Uh, many people see Maurice as one of the uh, top journalists uh, in the game. Uh, he uh, made his fame because he became the uh, journalist of the Deep Blue Match, both from 1996 and 1997. In 1999, Maurice became the first black grandmaster uh, just for the general audience, Grandmaster is the highest title that you can get in chess. Uh, the first Grandmaster was in 1950. Uh, Maurice made it in, in 1999. In essence, it took 49 years uh, before we had our first uh, Black uh, Grandmaster. Uh, and finally, as a, in 2014, as a tournament organizer, uh, Maurice uh, put together the first millionaire uh, tournament in American history. Uh, Maurice has succeeded as a coach, as a commentator, as a chess player, and also as a uh, tournament organizer. Would like to talk about Watu Kabasi. Uh, met Kabasi many times, both here in New York and in uh, South Africa. Uh, Kabasi speaks 11 languages. Seven of, them, seven of them are African languages and four of them are European languages, which he reads and writes uh, in Russian. Uh, for many of you know, there are more books written in Russian uh, on chess than any other language. He has the unique distinction, uh, uh, Kabezi, of beating a top 10 player in the world. In fact, he beat a top five player in the world in Peter Le uh, Leko in 2001. For anyone who wants to see the uh, presentation, I have left the game uh, here. I paste it in the presentation. Uh, lastly, uh, he has an award-winning uh, Mazda commercial, a uh, brilliant commercial. Uh, he's a great storyteller. So besides being uh, international chess master, uh, he's now a promoter of the game. Finally, I would like to mention Robert Gwazi. Uh, Robert Gwazi is from Zimbabwe. At uh, 15 years old, he became the... Uh, junior champion of Zimbabwe. At 16, he became the national champion of his country. He also reached the international uh, master title at the age of 16. He had a remarkable showing in 2002. Uh, he won the uh, gold medal on board one over Gary Kasparov. Uh, his score was nine out of nine in the uh, 2002 Bled Olympiads. Uh, no other player other than Ali Ekin has ever scored nine out of nine in a Olympiad tournament. He also got two uh, Grandmaster Norms. All right, so 
uh, brief summary here, an early start is important. I would suggest if we want to close the achievement gap, we start chess at, uh, in kindergarten. Our tracking is very important. Uh, for scholars that show more passion, we sh they should be put in elective programs along so alongside after school uh, programs. If we increase the number of hours, uh, we increase the possibility of kids uh, raising their rating. Same thing if we increase uh, the number of games, games equals patent recognition. The number of games also uh, means we can increase their strategic and tactical e e execution. The, the utilization of digital tools is very important. Google Classroom allows us to micro-target each student inside of the classroom. Google Forms allows us to measure assessments. We can use Excel sheets uh, to, as data transference uh, to measure um, the average rating in each section in any, given, in any given nationals. We should look at chess as a academic boost, a competitive sport and a life skill. And lastly, I would like to say that we should integrate uh, the history of black chess players and this players of color in general into the curriculum. It makes chess a universal and it makes chess everyone's game. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Right. Well, thank you, Gerald. That was an outstanding presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. And now, I believe, Tim, you have some questions for Gerald? Uh, yes. Uh, Gerald, can I get you to stop the screen share? There we go. Yes, we have a number of people that wanted to know some items. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the average rating of your students? <laughs> um, well, that depends. I've had so many... Um, uh, students and I played in various sections. Uh, I can give you the highest average rating of, of my students. Uh, when I was the director of Success Academy, uh, we had a team uh, at Hudson Yards, and I will say that uh, they averaged uh, uh, in the 1700 uh, rating range. All right. Uh, let's see. The next question is uh, What do you recommend focusing on in your curriculum? Well, curriculum is usually three things. Uh, one, it is a scope and sequence. Uh, two, it is scaffolded content. And three, it's assessment tools. Uh, again, we want to begin where they are. Uh, but the fundamentals, I mean, I, I think like everything else, if kids do not grasp the fundamentals, uh, it will be more, much more difficult to advance them uh, in theory. Uh, I will say there's a concept of general knowledge, which is principles, uh, the tendency of attack and so forth, and there is specific knowledge. Uh, when we say specific knowledge, it means how do we pre prepare for the competition or, uh, or lines of the Roy Lopez and so forth. So um, again, it depends on uh, who the curriculum is for, is, if it's for more advanced players or beginning players, but if it's for beginning players, definitely the fundamentals. All right, next question is, uh, just wanted to know, I noticed you call students scholars. What effect do you think psychology plays in teaching the scholars? A great question. Uh, it's one of the things I learned when I started working in the uh, uh, charter movement. They do, not, they do not use the word uh, kids. They sometimes use the word students, uh, but scholars create a mindset of academics, of scholastics, and of learning. Uh, names are important, so we associate sc a scholar uh, scholars were studying, I think it kind of redefines uh, their sense of self. All right, next question. Do you think it makes sense to start chess in preschool earlier than kindergarten? <laughs> well, there's actually a, uh, a company, it used to be called Chess at Three, and they start uh, chess at three years old. And they'll teach them like the names of the pieces, they give stories about each chess piece, uh, they teach them what a light square is, what a dark square is. So it's so it turns out that uh, evidently this is a huge advantage if you can start chess at an early age. Okay. Next question: How do you think streaming will impact the future of chess education? For example, Nakamura's popularity in streaming has brought lots of new energy to chess. How do you see this playing out long term? All right, so that's a very powerful uh, point because. We have now in chess something known as influences. So we have chess influences. 
Now, Nakamura is high up there, former number two player in, in the world. Uh, but you have a lot of influence, influences in chess who are in Twitch channels. And um, they have over 100,000 uh, followers. Uh, recently, Maurice Ashley did a uh, Twitch channel show. I think he had um, a famous scientist on there. He had Tani. This is a young African-American uh, kid uh, who's 10 years old, who's also going to be chess master uh, uh, pretty soon. So an influencer is anyone that can excite you about chess. Streaming is the venue by which uh, we can excite people about chess. I think st streaming will bring in, bring in a broader audience. I definitely think it's a transformative tool in the game. Next question. How often do you use chess books or literature when designing curriculum? And what are three of your favorite titles that you've used in your curriculum? All right, so uh, first let me just, just talk about the scope and sequence. I think one of the most important uh, curriculums is the kindergarten curriculum. Uh, when I say the scope and sequence here, I, I just don't mean something that is time stamped. In October, you learn this. In November, you learn that. Uh, that's also part of a curriculum. But the scope and sequence also is first we teach the board, then we teach the pieces, and then we teach uh, the rules of the game. Um, I draw from a various uh, sources. I have over 400 chess books uh, in my house. I, uh, whatever is necessary for a particular uh, curriculum, I may use Pandolfini's Endgame course. I may use um, Aaron Nemzovich's uh, My System. Uh, I may use uh, famous players' uh, games like uh, Fisher's My 60 Memorable Games or Gary Kasparov's games, uh, whatever I think is appropriate for that particular population. Next question, are there any special drills or programs to assist the scholar's ability to concentrate in general? Well, you, you know, I believe in increasing the number of hours. I believe in increasing, increasing the number of games. I believe it has a byproduct uh, on their focus skills, uh, on their patent recognition, on their confidence, on their ability uh, to, uh, to perform under stress. I do think that playing longer games will increase uh, focus skills. Uh, I do also think that online games, because you can play so many different games and you can see so many va various styles, uh, may also increase uh, in focus skills. Uh, but really, I believe over the board chess, uh, long term or six hour, four hour games are the ways to increase uh, the focus skills. Next question. Since they call chess the game of life. As a chess master, what's one lesson you've undoubtedly learned from playing chess? <laughs> well, uh, many lessons, by the way. And often when you lose, you, uh, you get a lesson. Um, well, first thing, the chess is uh, the game of life. Uh, the chess pieces, for example, the rooks are the banks, the knights are the military class, uh, the bishops are the religious class, the king and queen are the political or the ruling class, and the pawns are the everyday people. A chessboard is a reflection of the world. Um, one of the early lessons I, I noted in beginning scholars, I would listen to their internal dialogue. Uh, for example, they would say, uh, Mr. Times, I moved here, and then I moved there, and then I checkmated. Uh, and then the, an older scholar, for example, a fifth grader might say, Mr. Times, I moved here, and then he moved here, and then I moved here and then I checkmated. it. In the second one, uh, there was an account of the other person. Uh, the first one was monologue. The second one was dialogue. This whole transformation of a sense of the other is not only a chess lesson, but I also think that it's a life lesson. All right. Uh, what, uh, next question. What role do you see for chess in schools that is not focused on Competitive chess. All right, so there is a kind of a harsh reality that for you to get better in chess, something has to be on the line. Uh, it's not a tea party. We cannot play chess randomly. Our curriculum classes are fine in terms of the introduction of the game, uh, but the skills that are gained in chess, uh, delay, gratif delay gratification, abstract reasoning, logical sequencing, all these additional school, uh, skill sets, they actually come through playing tournament games. So there's really a big distinction between a casual chess and just learning to move the pieces and competing against another person. Uh, that other person brings the best out of you. All right, next question. 
Do you ever teach to study your opponent's personality traits when getting ready for competition? <laughs> All right, so uh, Sun Tzu, who's a very famous uh, warrior, uh, philosopher, he has a very famous line. He says, know your enemy, know yourself. In a thousand battles, uh, you will never lose. I would like to shift this here just a little bit to the uh, 1966 World Championship match. Uh, Spassky is playing a Petrosian. Uh, Spassky, by the way, is a phenomenal talent. Uh, he is uh, considered the first universal chess player. Uh, he can attack like Tao. He can defend like Petrosian. Uh, but he actually loses this match in 1966. Uh, he goes back to Mikhail Bavanik, who was the father of Russian chess. He's also the sixth uh, world champion. And he says to Bavanik, why did I lose this game? And Bavanik asks the great Boris Spassky a very simple question. Did you study your opponent? Could you predict his moves? It's a very important lesson to learn, even for someone who's as talented as Boris Spassky, that self-knowledge is not enough. I also need to understand the other person. Uh, in 1969, he studied, uh, uh, studied Petrosian, and he eventually won the world championship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we only have a few more minutes left in the presentation. Uh, if you have any pressing questions, uh, we're going to take just hey. one or two more questions. Tim, so. I, Tim, I've got one from somebody. Uh, they wanted to know uh, what motivated uh, Gerald to get into teaching chess. <laughs> All right. So I will admit that there's kind of two tigers in me in 2002. Uh, my FIDE rating was 2,400. Uh, it's 100 points away from... Grandmaster had already achieved the rating of international master. It's exactly at this time uh, that uh, Jeffrey Kanja of the Harlem Children's Zone offered me a position uh, to teach chess uh, uh, inside of the inner city. It was a fantastic program. It was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, so those are kind of always the two dilemmas of my life. I love to play chess as a competitor, but my passion has really been about closing the achievement gap uh, with inner city children uh, and chess. And so I have uh, both motivations, uh, Jim. I hope that answers that other person's question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions. Right. Rolling no more? Okay. Well, then at this time, I'm very pleased to say that Dean Fair will now present the Chess Educator of the Year Award to Gerald Times. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's great. We can read that. Very good. Mr. Times presented to the Chess Educator of the Year 2021, Gerald Times by the University of Texas at Dallas Chess Program. Thank you very much for a very enjoyable evening and an enlightening evening for chess. We all will be better chess players as a result of your information that you've given yeah. today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Stallings, Mr. Fair. It's been an incredible run. I see a lot of friends in the room. Thank you for joining this uh, presentation. All right. With that, we're right on time. That concludes our presentation for this evening. Thank you very much.